Our speaker is a long time uh, job search, uh, Launchpad Job Club board member. Our, for many years, he was our longest serving board member, and we love him a lot. He speaks every time he's back in town. Uh, he is uh, the, now he is a, a career pivot community manager, and I hope you will talk about your operation and how it has changed and evolved and what you do now. Uh, we think maybe there are people here who might be interested and I certainly want to know all the details about it. So his job title is provocative. It's called Embrace Creative Destruction or Be a Turkey. It's your choice. <clears throat> he is the founder of Career Pivot, which helps those in the second half of life design careers that they can grow into for the next 30 years. Mark authored the book Repurpose Your Career, a Practical Guide for the Second Half of Life, which published in uh, the second edition, published in September 2019. He is a recovering engineer, a multi-potentialite. No, a multi-potentialite. I love it. Uh, so lots of potential, multi-potentialite, okay, I, we just have to memorize that, a multi-potentialite and a professional career changer as he has made six, count them, six career pivots over the last 35 years. He is also the podcast host of the award-winning Repurpose Your Career podcast. You can learn more about Mark, I'm sure he's going to throw this up on the board, uh, you can learn more about Mark, Career Pivot, and the Repurpose Your Career podcast by visiting careerpivot.com. Let's give a very warm welcome to our good friend, Mark Miller. Hola, mi amigos. ¿Cómo está? Muy bien. Uh, if you can't tell, I, I now live in Mexico, Ajiji, Mexico. Um, and what I'm going to do is very quickly give you a rundown of who I am so you understand. By the way, I was born in New York City, the Bayside, Queens. I grew up at Joyce, Exit 9 on the Joyce Turnpike, and I'm going back to my 45th high school reunion next week. I went to Northwestern. I graduated in three and a half years, and by the way, when I graduated from high school, I barely could read. I read it about 30 words a minute. I was very, very severely learning disabled, which my son inherited all of which. And when I graduated in three and a half years, I did not take a single English course. I then went to work for the Borg. I mean IBM. Uh, yes, I was assimilated. Resistance was futile. And I have to be careful about using the Borg analogy because if I get the young kids, they don't know who the Borg is. Uh, I claim I wandered around for 22 years, all here in Austin. I started out as a programmer. My very first job was having a coding pad doing word processing development where I had to sit in an office eight hours a day and write on a coding pad. I have a very short attention span. I then went off into quality assurance system test. I then ran a help desk for, I was pulling mechanical, was pulling drafting boards away from mechanical engineers and putting on big CAD CAM light, with big light pens. I had a big, huge mainframe back there with 64 megabytes of memory. <laughs> I then went into training. I ran a, when IBM started for you geeks, when IBM started to get into Unix, uh, I ran the Worldwide Technical Support Training Program. I then crossed into the dark side. Uh, I went into sales. Actually, I went into an IBM briefing center. And that's important because that was probably the best tr speaker training you can possibly get. I also convinced myself I became an extrovert, which I am not. So when I'm done here, <laughs> I then became an IT consultant. I did one stint in, I in IBM Global Services of all things at Easy Corp. Pawn shops. You want to talk about it? business that sucks, <laughs> loaning money to the poor at 20% a month. Oh, oh. 
And I finished off at marketing in, in 1999. IBM screwed me on my pension. Then they gave it back to me and I said, I don't trust you anymore. So I gave them the single finger salute. And I went to work for a tech startup. It was Agira. I wish I had the logo. We had a cool logo. We were the fastest company from inception to acquisition uh, at 18 months. We were acquired by Lucent, which was the sister of the Borg. Uh, they were incredibly screwed up. There were 195,000 employees when they bought us. When they finally merged with Alcatel in 2006, 2007, there were 25,000. When they spun us out and they, they had the same, they already had the name, so they, uh, they just called us, a gear, rather than a, we were a gear, uh, and then we became a gear systems. And the key piece here was uh, we were 17,000 employees. By the time I left in 2004, or late 2003, early 2004, we were down to 6,000. And I was on the team in Austin that was picking who got laid off next. So then I had a moment of clarity. I'm a big time cyclist. I came down, I was riding with the Austin Cycling Association. I came down a hill. This was uh, exactly two weeks after my accident. So on July 11th of 2002, I came down a hill, turned into a corner on Westlake Drive, a blind turn, and hit a Toyota Corolla head on. This is no namby pamby aluminum bike. This is a heavy duty touring frame. And it's bent. So I spent five days in the Brack Trauma Center. I, uh, I tore up a knee, I broke a hip, I dislocated a shoulder, broke a bunch of ribs, uh, broke the clavicle, but I had no internal injuries and no brain injuries I'm willing to admit to. <laughs> uh, they had me walking on crutches in three days. I was back on a bike in 10 weeks, flying back to China in four months. At those speeds, you have a 10% survival rate. The technical term was I was effing lucky. Uh, I Oh, by the way, I, when I flew back into China, I flew right smack into the middle of the SARS epidemic. <coughs> That's my WTF moment. Why am I still doing this? Our son had graduated from high school, was off to college. Agira left us, our Lucent options were worthless, but I got well over $150,000 in retention bonuses, which allowed me to pay off the house, finish paying off our son's college ed education, which we were dead free in my late 40s. So I then went and said, I'm going to go to Austin Community College, get my certification, teacher certification. And I got more funny stories of this because I ignored every sign that they did not want me. Okay? The first question on the, on the, on the application was, what was my college GPA? Huh? I don't know. Do you know what your college GPA is? I certainly didn't. Oh. Can you give me the names and telephone numbers of all your previous supervisors? My first boss in Chicago in 1976 was Bob Buckholz. He was in his late 40s, a heavy smoker. I think his telephone number is 1-800-HEAVEN. <laughs> <laughs> but I did get hired as an algebra teacher at Aikens High School. I was incredibly successful. I didn't last but a year and a half. Uh, I mean, I blew the doors off getting my kids pass the exit tax test. If I can train engineers in China, I can train a bunch of Hispanic, very, very poor. 90% of my kids, 90% of my kids were what we call limited English proficiency, or LEP, uh, on free and reduced lunch. And also 90% of my kids had probation officers. That does not mean they were bad kids. They come from poverty. That's when I, when I left there, that's when I discovered Launchpad in 2006. I uh, walked into a room much like this and I said, wow, everybody looks like me. Uh, and I've served on the board from 2006 until last year. I then, I joke, I went to work to the, for the JCAA doing fundraising. By the way, I'm not Jewish. <laughs> being the corporate face for a Jewish organization, a non-Jew being a face of a Jewish organization is interesting. And, and, and as I will discover as I go back to my high school reunion, 90% of my classmates in high school were all Jewish. I then went to work for a life size. Uh, notice I went to work for the first startup in 2000, and then this one in December of 2007. I have incredible timing. I, I timed both of them to be synchronized with recessions. 
I lasted until 2011 when I was working for a sociopath, and I once again gave, my, gave him the single finger salute. We were bought out by Logitech. In 2012 is when I launched Career Pivot. I looked and I said, okay, all these people that look like me, who's caring about their careers? Nobody. We're all supposed to go retire. And where I, and in 2013, came out and repurposed your career practical guide for baby boomers. In 2017, we came out with a second edition, which we primarily, talking about how do I transition, because I have been a professional career changer. And I've been, I've been successful. The talk I gave on Monday, which I know a couple of you came and saw, is I talked about how I recovered from my three failures. And then we just came out with this book, and I've donated 10 books to, to Launchpad. They're out front. All I ask is you make a donation of any amount. And then if you sell those out, you can buy one from me. And the reason why I insist that you make a donation is if, if I give them away for free, people don't read them. So I, I'm doing, I, I've done one this, uh, did Hired Texas, I'm doing four different job clubs up in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. I'm doing the same thing with each one of them because I want you to read it. And this is the kind of book that you just don't read through and suddenly go, oh yeah, I get it. It's something that you have to sit and ponder on. Almost everybody in this room has been, has been working for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. We've all screwed up. We've also all been situations where we've been happy. Why? Many of us become actors when we started our careers. We play roles. I can't say for all of you, but for at least for me and a lot of people I talk to, by the time we hit our 50s, it is really exhausting staying in character. I couldn't do that. That's, that's one thing that happened when I taught high school. I, 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 I was a professional presenter. I was a geek that could speak. I was on stage, what, three hours a week? When I was a teacher, I was on stage for 35 hours a week. And now, that's my lovely wife. I live in Ahihik. Again, this guy a little squeeze there because I copied over. Uh, I live outside of Guadalajara on the largest lake, uh, uh, four blocks from Lake Chapala. Chapala is the largest lake in Mexico, which means it's about the size of Lake Travis. Uh, we're living on about $30,000 a year. And by the way, the average temperature year round is 72 degrees. It's really rough. <laughs> It has one of the top three climates in the world. Um, and, and, and if anyone's interested, I'll be happy to talk about all this stuff at the end. Now, this talk has, I've, I've, has, has morphed over the years. But one of the key things here is creative destruction. We, those of us, and I'm 63, I was not raised for things to change this fast. So, creative destruction describes the process of industrial <coughs> mutation that, in, that, in, that incessantly revolutions the, the economic structure from within and incessantly destroys the old one and incessantly creates a new one. In other words, every time we bring in new technology, it destroys old technology. And what's happened is it now accelerates. Now, you can either stay up and, and be willing to adapt, or as I like to say, be a turkey. And this is one of my favorite, I, I've got a whole chapter on this in my book. A butcher feeds a turkey for a thousand days. Every day the turkey's life remains constant, confirms the surety of his, uh, of his current existence. This is the way it goes. This is the way it will always go on. This is the way it will always go. The problem is all this, all his data confirms that butchers love turkeys, and they do. The turkey can rest confident in this idea because he has 999 days of benevolent treatment to back it up. And then a few days before Thanksgiving, everything changes. 
everything in his worldview is upturned. This is what Talib, and by the way, this is a real interesting book, calls a black swan event. All evidence proves it, can, it can't happen until it does. We are all, you will experience black swan events. And one of the key things that you have to understand, because, by the way, most of you, as you hit your 60s and 70s, and most of us will work into our 70s, it's probably working for yourself. And I'll use the example, career pivot was going on really nicely, growing 20% a year until Donald Trump got elected. I'm serious. The, 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 the last three months of 2016, my business collapsed. Now my website kept on growing, traffic kept on growing, everything kept on growing except people stopped calling me. People froze. I'll use, I, I, my, my, the SEO company I use, their business cut, was cut 50% right after the election because B2B businesses stopped spending money for about nine months. It's, call, it's called uh, uncertainty. One of the things you have to be prepared is financially, but more importantly, emotionally. Because stuff will happen. So, I'll use the example. By the way, this, this example comes from, there was a really good, I listened to the Freakonomics podcast. And if anyone's interested, I can send you a, a link to the, the podcast. But pianos, 1905, they, Steinway and those companies were making 400,000 pianos a, a year. If you wanted music in your home, you bought a piano and you learned to play it. It was big business. Well, the phonograph, 1877, right? 1905, that's a long time. Then came along the radio. So by 1919, phonographs revenue was three times versus pianos. But remember, this took 40, 50 years? By 30, 1933, thir two-thirds of all households had, had radios. Today, they, they build about 30,000 pianos a year now. By the way, Steinway stopped making pianos during World War II. They made coffins. And their leftover wood was worthless. So, and again, that took 50 years for that transition, Ken. But what came out of that? It was our music industry. Anybody remember vinyl records? <laughs> yeah, of course. Right? Uh, but, and, and think, you know, like right now, I can produce a podcast. I produce it largely on free software. Uh, I do it on my computer. Actually, when I interview somebody, I use, I use uh, Skype and a product from Rogo Media called Piazzo. It runs on the Mac. It was really expensive, $19. Mm -hmm. Right? But this has created tons of jobs. Not if you were in the piano industry. Let's talk about photography. Anybody remember these guys? <laughs> what business were they in? Film. Film. Right? One of the things you discovered with, with photography was every time they introduced a new film format, business went up. So the last one was this guy. Right? You know, auto-loading. Uh, and rather interesting, I had, I was working for IBM, I was working in a briefing center in the mid-90s, to mid -90s, and we had Kodak in. And Kodak knew they were in trouble because their business was built around film. The digital camera, which Kodak was the very first one to have in 1975, they didn't do anything with it because they said, why would anybody want to watch, look at their pictures on a TV set? 
By 2001, and I remember this because I had a Kodak digital camera. I remember being in the Shanghai Grand Hyatt taking a picture because I, I, I walked into, the, into the, the, the room and there was a little teddy bear on my bed. And I took a picture, attached, attached it to the USB port on my, on my, on my uh, laptop and emailed my wife the picture. They were the number two in the market. By the way, they were losing $60 on every camera. Now notice, 1975 to 2001. So, and of course, 2012 they declared bankruptcy. Things are starting to speed up. But what came out of this was the whole digital revolution. You know, I used the example, you know, you got people like Adobe. Anybody, who, who uses Canva? Okay, you all need to know, who, who's familiar with Canva? You need to know about Canva. It is essentially, it's Photoshop Lite and it's largely the four letter F word, free. By the way, I used to have a, I had a customer at IBM who would always say, yeah, but does, does it follow the four letter F word? <laughs> okay, uh, anybody send Jacqueline Lawson uh, cards? These are, these are uh, they, they used to be flash. They're, my wife always sends me these. I have several other people send me. Uh, she has a nice business doing this. Uh, this is my buddy Steve Coyle. He lives up in Round Rock. He is a little photographer. He, 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 besides being a wedding photographer, which I, I can't imagine being a wedding photographer and dealing with bridezillas, uh, but Steve likes it. But he, he, his wife has retired from Apple, and his wife is 15 years older than him, so he's still working. He works from the road. And they travel all over the place, he's taking pictures, and he sells them online. He has a wall calendar, he sells them on, um, on, on mugs, all kinds of stuff. It pays for his travel and pays for all his equipment. You couldn't do that just a few years ago. Amazon, 1993, right? Anybody, does anybody remember them back from 93? No, because they basically, all they did was sell books. They put Borders Books out of business in 2011. So it took less than 20 years to drive their, their, their major competitor completely out. Notice how things are accelerating? <laughs> this is the one, when I first did this presentation about two years ago, I have a Vitamix. I love my Vitamix. And I got up on a Sunday morning and I dropped the container, it's plastic, and it broke. <coughs> so I immediately got online, found it on Amazon, and you know what was delivered to me by five o'clock that night? Wow. Yes, wow. So I think who was in the retail <coughs> here? This is destroying retail. Right? Think of the people who've gone out of business. And by the way, it's not just retail, but it's, all, it's everything around supply chain. It's advertising. Everything that feeds retail is dying, and dying fast. Now, fulfillment by Amazon. You know what? I self-publish my own book. I can do this. By the way, I did pre-orders on Amazon Advantage. Um, you know, I use KD, kdp.amazon.com to, to, to do the fulfillment. Uh, I had, on, in my online community, I had my buddy Jean LaFay come on this last week. It's the third time I've had her on for a Wednesday, uh, Wednesday evening uh, Zoom call. Jean is 71. She's my, she's spoken here. She's my image consultant here in Austin. By the way, I'm an autumn. 
<laughs> she, she did my colors. She also cleaned out my closet, made my wife very happy. Jean has started a fulfillment by Amazon company. Who's familiar with, with FBA? Who's heard of it? Okay, fulfillment by Amazon, you ship them products, they'll, they'll put them online and they'll do all the fulfillment. So her first product, which she is having sourced out of China, is a pierced earring back, not the earring, but the back, for women with sagging earlobes. I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> okay. Um, she's doing this through, there's a company here in Austin, happens to be here in Austin, called the Amazing Selling Machine, that teaches people how to sell online. She's running Amazon ads, she's running Facebook ads, and, and, and she's rebranded using Wardrobe Jazz. She got the logo done over Fiverr. She had the logo done and a bunch of other stuff done for about 60 bucks. And now she's taken her entire business, which was Panache Images and changing over to Wardrobe Jazz. You couldn't do this five years ago. There was a gentleman here uh, who I helped, helped out, uh, who was uh, on the side, he and his wife did uh, retail arbitrage. Anybody know what retail arbitrage is? It <laughs> is retail arbitrage is where you, you become a certified Amazon vendor, which means you can now whip out your phone with the Amazon app, walk into Walmart or Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever, walk the clearance aisle, you can scan an item and you can see what it will sell on Amazon for. And if it's cheap enough, you pick it up, you buy it, you ship it to Amazon, sell it online. So there were several articles in the Wall Street Journal about when <coughs> Toys R Us was going out of business. There were people scouring the Toys R Us looking for the hot products that they could get at incredibly discounted prices. Now, is that for everybody? The answer is no. But it is for some people. The point is you couldn't even do that five years ago. And I use this example. This is my buddy Elias. He was my Leadership Austin class. These are workout gloves. And then he has the second product now, which is this kind of wristband. He sources, he, bought, he, he gets on Alibaba, he buys the design. He, on Alibaba, he, find, he finds a manufacturer. These are shipped directly from the manufacturer to Amazon. And he sells them. And he makes a couple grand a month. Again, you can't do this. I mean, this, 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 is, untr this is uncharted territory. It's similar with myself. I can produce a book. I have my own imprint, Career Pivot Publishing. And again, I couldn't have done that 10 years ago. <coughs> and by the way, my last book sold about 3,000 copies. And right now, you know, I, 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 ha I now have a review team of 200 plus people. We've already got almost 30 reviews in the first week. I can do that, L little old me. I can do what big publishers used to do. Oh, this is, this is, uh, this is Gene's product, yeah. right? Now, by the way, you can, you can buy these on Home Shopping Network. Right? So the point here is, and I, I had her come on because she's talking, by the way, when she put the first product up, it got yanked down the first day. Because she violated someone's design patent. And she's going, how did I miss that? And the answer was, when she did her patent search, which she did herself, um, the, the person who was patenting the design hadn't finished the process yet. So she would never found it. But actually, this but by having the product yanked down, it actually forced her to rebrand herself. It actually, it was a good thing. And she only ordered, I think, 200, 300 uh, 
of the product. So she, yeah, she lost a little bit of money, but she hadn't started running ads. Uh, this is the, this, this, I'm a big fan of uh, Pat Flynn and Par Smart Passive Income. And they had these guys on talking about how to, how to do retail arbitrage. So, 2007, notice how things are speeding up. 2007, the iPhone came out. Remember they used, people used to buy cameras? <laughs> right? It, it, rather interesting, Cisco, I think in 2006, bought Flip. That was the first HD video camera. They killed it three years later. Remember these things called maps? <laughs> yes. And I said, driving from here through Mexico down, down, down to Ajijic. I don't know how people did this before Ms. Google. Mm -hmm. By the way, the drive from Laredo to Ajijic is almost entirely on toll roads. Hmm. Which was safer. Yes. Believe it or not, I have, I have, uh, we'll talk about this later, but I have lots of people bang, banging on me. Well, aren't you scared? And the answer is no. Oh, I'm, road, safe. Yes, well, even where I live is safe. Okay. Uh, remember, you used to what, get your sports in the newspaper? Or better yet, I, I, I have tile on everything because I suffer from CRS. Can't remember stuff. <laughs> oh, by the way, every time I get stopped by the cops, which is rarely I have on my State Farm, I have my insurance, because I have the State Farm insurance app. I can watch Sling TV, which I can't do in Mexico. Uh, lots of interesting things about licensing of content. Uh, oh, yeah. My wife asked me when we were driving around, she asked me a question. And so I can answer her stupid questions by looking it up on Google. <laughs> no, they're not stupid questions. We've only been married 38 years. Okay. Then remember, we used to have phones on our... Uh, oh yeah, uh, Skype. Uh, and we, we even text message, right? And this is the interesting one, is almost everybody down where we, you know, we don't use the, 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 the regular phone, we use WhatsApp. And WhatsApp is one of the biggest applications in the world. I just register based on my phone number and people call me. But this is the CIA doesn't like this because this is all encrypted. And I don't, I, So, that was from 2007 to today. Think about what, what the iPhone has done to various businesses. Think about what smartphones are gonna continue to do. So, one of the things I claim is as we start looking at the fight for 15 and uh, raising a minimum wage, you're gonna see more and more retail operations, particularly retail food, let me order my, let me order stuff right here. The point I'm trying to make is if you think your career and your job is immune to AI, automation, and robotics, you are smoking something and yes, you are inhaling. And yes, it's still, <laughs> and yes, it's still illegal in Texas. So. Things like uh, social media, uh, Internet of Things. I mean, this is just, I mean, we are just at the cusp of this. The, t the whole, you know, I can find, I, I have, I have a tile on my, on my key ring. I can find it. Um, a lot of the kids, you know how they use these? They, they put these on the, uh, they, they glue them to the light switch, and so when they can't, when they don't know where their iPhone is, they just come over and beep this, and it beeps their their phone. 
and causes it to start to rain. Because Lord forbid you can't find your, your phone. <laughs> Think of the app development. This is one of the things, if you look at the startup culture, I spent a lot of years in, in Austin in high tech. When I was, you know, when I said my first tech startup in 2001 was a semiconductor startup. We, if you go back to the mid 90s, we had probably 10 to 15 different semiconductor fabs in Austin. <clears throat> you know how many we have now? One. And what's the name of that? Samsung. Samsung. That's it. I know from my online community, and I know from people, a lot of folks in this town who are my age were in the hardware business and developing hardware. That is gone. It is all software. And what you quickly find is also the barriers to entry have shrunk dramatically. I can pay someone to develop my, a career pivot app. And I probably spend less than $5,000. Ah, you want to make music, podcast, audiobooks? I do it all myself. By the way, my, my last corporate gig at Life Size Communications, I did 21 hours of voiceovers. And by the way, I record everything on free software from, uh, from Audacity. I record... Uh, ACX is uh, Amazon's uh, self-publishing arm for audio. You can produce your own audiobooks. You can put them up for sale. My, my last two audiobooks are up, up for sale on both, both Amazon and uh, iTunes. Am I a rocket scientist to know how to do that? Hell no. But I can do it. In fact, one of the things I encourage everyone to do is think about writing a book. Even if it's a 60 to 100 page book. By the way, when I wrote the first book, I, I follow, I have a good friend named Gushan Bergman. Gushan, he now lives down in Kyle. He's written about 40 or 50 self-published books. By the way, it's Gushan is Icelandic, which is, as he said, Gushan is the opposite of bad job. And his philosophy, and I quoted him for 10 years now, is when you write a book, you write a book and not the book. So when Susan and I wrote the first Repurpose Your Career, I worked, Susan's my ghostwriter, I hand, we, we did a white paper together, I then handed her a whole bunch of blog posts which she then put together into a book. It was, and, and by the way, you need 131 pages in a book on Amazon from, uh, uh, at that time, it was create space in order to get a, a binding on the side. Okay? So what we did was we picked the paper size and the font size to get us to 140 pages. <laughs> I'm a recovery engineer. <laughs> so what did we do with the next book? Everyone, the only complaint from the first book was all the career stories were mine. Fine. Three years later, we publish it with a whole bunch, we added a whole bunch of stories. And we increased the physical size of the book. So we were still about 140 pages. This one, we're now at 180 pages, and what we did was I added a, a whole bunch of stuff, like I've got a whole chapter on creative destruction. I've got a chapter on what I call MSU disorder. MSU stands for make stuff up. And anybody says you don't do that is lying. <laughs> so, have I scared you? <laughs> or are you excited? excited. Okay? Scared. This is the world that, is, is that we, we have today. And it is not going to slow down. The rate of change is not going to slow down. One of the things I see in Ahihik is we now see a lot of what I call economic refugees. By the way, there's somewhere between one and two million Americans living in Mexico. There are nine million Americans living outside the U.S. who are not uh, in the military. 
And these people are largely moving because they have to, because they can't afford to live in the U.S. anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what do you do? The first thing I'm going to tell you is, you are responsible for your own education. You know, I grew up with IBM, and they paid for everything. Your employer ain't going to pay for crap anymore. So one of the things I'm going to tell you is, on your nickel, I want you to attend at least one industry conference a year. Yes, you and, and by the way, they don't have to be expensive, but from a networking perspective, from a you know, just staying on top of the, your industry. If you think you're all going to do online and not talk to people outside of your little cocoon, you're in trouble. Second, who listens to podcasts? You should all be listening to podcasts. They are the, again, the four letter F word, free. I am a podcast addict. I listen to podcasts on my walk. I, when I get on a treadmill or an elliptical trainer, I'm, you know, um, it, I, it uses all of the time that I'm normally, you know, that essentially I could be learning. The third thing is <coughs> there is so much online training on out there available and it's, it's either low cost or free. One of my most popular blog posts gets, gets found lots of times every single day is getting a college degree after 50. If you say you're going to go back for a master's degree, I want you to stop and think. Will it ever pay for itself? And the answer from most people is no. If, if you look at, particularly as we get <coughs> a little bit older, uh, that kind, getting into a certificate program, doing online training, is, is where it actually will make sense. And for those of you who are younger, ladies, gals, dudes, you need to be constantly be keeping your skills up to date. And it doesn't have to be, so industry conferences, I used the example, I originally did, did this a couple of years ago. Uh, I went to the career development conference uh, up in Denver. I flew up in Southwest. I stayed at a decent hotel that was about a mile away. I had dinner at Whole Foods. I kept my costs very low. Uh, what I got out of it, I have, I got, two or three absolute nuggets out of that conference. I'm a Berkman consultant. Uh, back in 2017, I went to the Berkman conference. Berkman is a, an assessment. Um, the one I'm, I've missed the last couple of years, I'm going to go back to this podcast movement. And I know a lot of people who go podcast movement don't attend a single session. They go there strictly for the... Uh, for the networking. And by the way, one of the things I learned by going to Podcast Movement, podcaster and radio people, they may get behind the, the you know, a microphone, they can be just as lively and fancy, but you get them in a, a room full of them, and there, you've never met a bunch of introverts. <laughs> you walk into a room of podcasters, and they all sit there. <laughs> I said, I do a lot of personality assessments. And it, was, it was an absolute scream. Uh, just get, when you know, suddenly went, wow. And by the way, I'm a big time introvert. You know, so don't let, don't let you think what you see is who I am. So, podcasts. I know, I hear, there's no podcast in my industry or for me. Well, you know what? There's a Chameleon Breeders podcast. <laughs> there are three quarters of a million podcasts. It's a joke. Now, by the way, today podcasts, if you get 
250 downloads in the first 30 days for <coughs> a episode, which is how most people measure podcasts, because most episodes... Most of the listens are done in the first 30 days after you publish. If you're, at, you're, if you're in the 200 to 250, you're in the top half of all podca podcasters on iTunes. In other words, there's a lots and lots of folks out there that get no downloads. I'm in the thousand a month, you know, th th thousand, epi thousand downloads per episode in the first 30 days. Now, by the way, that got accelerated because I made in May of 2018. I got put in AARP magazine. <laughs> I have a love-hate relationship with AARP. <laughs> AARP is a weird organization. Okay, so, but if there is no podcast, why don't you create one? It's not hard. You can do it Ongoing, I, I pay $20, $20 a month to Libsyn for my hosting. Everything else I, I could do myself. You was, and, and one of the, the, the cool things about podcasts, I get people who reach out to me and they go, they've been listening to my podcast for a while. They'll go, wow, I actually know you because you're listening to someone's voice. Versus reading somebody's, reading people's, it's it's very personal. And by the way, if you go to careerpivot.com/expat, you will find all my blog posts and my podcasts on being an expat. And I've done about twenty, of both combination between blog and 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 my my blog posts for next Monday will be what I'm experiencing coming back to the U.S. after being away for you know sixteen months. Uh, you know what? I need a car here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can find this on iTunes, Google Play, there are all kinds of Stitcher. Um, by the way, you should listen to my podcast. Uh, I am now up, I'm going to be producing episode 150 here in the next few weeks. One of the things that happened to me was podcasting is just like any other medium. The first ones you produce will suck. It's kind of like my first year of blog, blogs on my website. They suck. I've deleted almost all of them. The point is you, you start getting your craft, you start understanding, or as I tell people, I am a, I am a wonderful interviewee. I suck as an interviewer. But people tell me, I'm a great interviewer when you listen to my podcast. Why? Because I know how to edit out my verbal vomit. <laughs> <laughs> but the point here is, when, I, when I, we were gone the previous summer, the summer of 2018, we were, we were in Mexico for five months, and my neighbors were pulling our mail. When I came back, and I was on episode 120, 130, I had five books from major publishers that they all sent me to say, I want, I want, my, want, want our author on your show. And I'm going. So this last year, I had Rich Carlgard, publisher of Forbes. I've had a bunch of folks on and I can get just about anybody in this space I want. By the way, Kathy was on the podcast uh, a few months ago. But the fact is, produce good information with good quality and be consistent. By the way, this, is a, this was a really cool episode. They approached me, uh, Nikki and David Yeager. Uh, Nikki is David's daughter. Uh, David was a stay-at-home stay dad. He's now 65. He wrote children's books, and he wrote them for Nikki. Nikki now lives in Thailand and has been um, illustrating the books. They are now set. She got them printed in Thailand, which apparently all children's books are printed in Thailand. I didn't know that. 
She's printing them in Thailand, shipping them over. They're selling them. And because this was, uh, the name of the book was, uh, I don't remember, but it was, it was about overcoming obstacles. And they're donating all money to legal fees for children who are being separated at the border. Really, really cool story. Well, they approached me. I didn't have to go find them. Or the podcast is it this week or yes, it was this week or last week is Paul Vogel Vogelzahn, and he is 62 now. He's going to be 63 here shortly. He was laid off from Oracle, as we just call, talked on the podcast. It was the technology company that begins with a big O or a big red O. He was laid off by, by them when he was 58. And he started up his podcast. And he's now, after three, three years, he's actually making, he's making money on the podcast. He's, he's doing podcasts with the Smithsonian and NASA. Is he making a ton of money? No. In my opinion, he's hitting the ball out of the park. And he's having fun. Yeah, you couldn't do that a few years ago. And by the way, he, had the, he and his wife had the first mommy podcast back in 2004, and they only ran that for about five years. Um, I listen to two financial podcasts. One is my buddy Roger Whitney, and I've been on his show several times, and he's been on my show, um, Retirement Answer Man, and, and this is one I, I love. I listen to every, every Sunday. Um, it's Money Matters. It's, it's two guys out of Sacramento, California, um, and they just rebranded themselves. Uh, from a social media perspective, I listen to the science of social media. That This is from Buffer. I'm a big time Buffer. I was a very early Buffer uh, customer. Uh, if you want to blog, I, I absolutely, I am a huge fan of Darren Rouse. And he's pro blogger. And he's Aussie, so he speaks funny. And he's fun to listen to. Uh, another one is Smart Passive Income with Pat Flynn. Now, online training. Who's familiar with MOOCs? Massively online, massively op massive open online courses. These come from major universities, whether it is EDX, uh, any one of the major platforms, whoops, most of these you'll have to pay for. Uh, Linda is now bound by LinkedIn. There's Coursera, Skillshare, Udemy. So, if you are not doing all three of these, you will be a turkey. Who's here been a turkey? Hopefully most of us. Because one of the things that you can end up, I, I had an article in, in, uh, in Forbes about living in a career disaster area at the age of 65. I had two different people I had worked with who saw their careers blown up in under five years. One was in big hardware, computer hardware. The other one had been in advertising primarily around real estate, home building, um, and I got her in all the way to the top of Keller Williams. <coughs> I got her in to talk to Joe Papazano, who helped write the one thing. She's 65. As Papazano told her, I don't think we have anybody under 40 other than me. I mean, over 40 other than me. When I was in college and people went into marketing, people went into marketing, she didn't need to know any math. Now this is all analytics. So, one of the things I'm going to encourage you to do as you look at your industry, or look, big one is shifting industries, which, for example, getting out of retail is trying to, is shifting industries, is make sure where are you going, does it have legs? Because so many industries are being disrupted. I can't tell you the number of people who say, well, I'm going to go be an adjunct professor. Yeah, right. 
do you realize how much community colleges and, and major universities are being disrupted? I've got one guy in my online community who suddenly he got offered to go teach at a, at online at the University of Maryland. He wasn't teaching at all. He was, he was moderating comments, grading a lot. In fact, I worked with a guy who was at the Macomb School of Business. As he claimed, he used to, he says he taught, he taught for free and he got paid the great papers. Because what he really enjoyed was that, that light bulb moments when people said, ah, I get it. Well, he moved it all online and now he hates it. Because he, he doesn't get that anymore. So, the last one I'm going to finish out with. Um, Russines is in my online community. He is what got hit by what I called a double whammy. He ran Menno Media for a dozen years. Any idea what that is? It's the publishing arm of the Mennonite Church. That's where I say he got hit with a double whammy. Any major religious institution in this country is shrinking. <laughs> publishing is being disrupted big time. After a dozen years, he got sick and tired of laying people off. He says, you only can lay off so many friends before you finally go, I can't do this anymore. If you listen to, if you go to episode number 143, and he wrote a blog post for me. He ended up hiking the Santiago. Okay. There's a trail across Spain in Portugal. He hiked 500 miles. He quit his job, took a year off. And his comment to me was, I had to get lost before I could find. And admitted he didn't know any idea where he was going. And he talks about the fact that when he was hiking the trail, he didn't know what day it was and, wh and, and what, what day of the week it was. And he was just getting up every morning and going to the next one. He now... He's just written a book on this experience, the hike, and he is, um, he's starting a, he started a business helping people self-publish. But he had to finally admit, I don't know where the hell I'm going. And most of us don't like admitting that. So. Did I scare you? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, one of the things, and I said I've got several chapters on this topic in, in the book. The key piece here is don't be a turkey. Okay? Mm. Figure out where you want to go. As I said, I, I have a whole chapter in the book on, um, you know, are you going to work into your 70s? Because most of us will. Pers it's, and some because we have to. And some because we want to. And by the way, it probably won't look like a full-time job. And when I, I was on a panel discussion about two years ago with a guy from New Zealand. And New Zealand has the interesting problem of the fact that when the kids graduate from school, they leave the island because there's enough jobs there for them. So what's happening is he actually helps companies retain their older workers. I think that interesting. And his comment to me that has stuck with me to this day, if you plan on working into your 70s, you need to plan that in your 50s. Because it's probably not a full-time job. It may be a collection of things. It may be writing books. It may be doing podcasts. It may be, you know, uh, you know it's, it's like I, I, I wrote a book, I wrote a blog post on being an uh, economic refugee. It was based on a woman in my Spanish class. And, and I've been helping her kind of get out of her own head saying, well, I, you know, I, I want a job. I said, no, you're gonna, what you're probably gonna do is a lot of personal services for the gringo community where everything's gonna be paid in cash. Like I had one guy, uh, a first, first trip down on the flight back, I was talking to this guy and uh, he, he'd been there a couple of years, and I said, do you work? And he says, yeah, I, I teach yoga classes. I said, are, are you legal to work there? He says, no, I'm a criminal. 
<laughs> I go into Guadalajara, they pay me in dollars. I teach you a good hockey he because they pay me in pesos. I'm a criminal. <laughs> it's, it's, it's thinking differently. Uh, so, if you're interested, I have, I have a Facebook page. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're interested in my online community, uh, I currently have somewhere between 40 and 50 members. Uh, this is a monthly paid community. One of the key things I actually, I, I built this community from what I learned from Kathy, is the fact that it's not about how I can help people. It's how everybody can help everybody else out. And one of the key things is getting out of inside your own head. Because I've told Kathy over the years, what she has created is a community that supports itself. And that's the key piece, is realizing you're not the only one. That's one of the things you find out when you walk in here. You're not the only one. And there are other people who are, when they are successful, you say, what did they do? And one of the common themes I discovered, by the way, I've developed curriculum in 40 different countries. And one of my mantras has always been, no matter who I think the audience is, I'm always wrong. Mm -hmm. Over half my audience is over 60. What they need, everybody wants freedom. Freedom to work <coughs> when they want to work, how they want to work. Uh, kind of sounds like the millennials. Uh, mm -hmm. Two, they need accountability. And three, they need the horizons broadened. As I've just shown you, Creative destruction will create new opportunities. Are you willing to embrace those? And with that, you can buy it on Amazon and both Kindle and, and, uh, and paperback, and uh, the Audible version will come out in January. <laughs> Got, it became too much work. <laughs> and make sure to get, hop on my podcast. Any questions? And I know I'm running real long. Nursing, I, you know, you're, it's going to be hard to get away from those. I guess. Well, th there's, there's no question that uh, jobs that require intuition, empathy, will always be there. How we implement those will change. Um, I said, my wife's a former nurse. And when my wife came down with a bout of anemia back in 2017, and when we went into the hospital, how they, the nurses function, didn't look anything like my wife when she used to work at C. I mean, they were all on checklists, they were all on, um, right? It, 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 everything had changed, uh, which is one of the problems. I, I, I can talk in nausea because we are in Mexico because of my wife's health care. Because it just, it just got too expensive here. But yes, you are less vulnerable. It's not going to go away, but it's going to change. Hopefully not too much before I retire. <laughs> well. uh, so you mentioned um, if we're looking for changing careers, changing corrections, we want to make sure whatever we're looking at has legs. Yes. How do we figure that out? By talking to a lot of people. Um, doing your research. Um, one of the things I just had a guy on John on my podcast called John, I think John Warner, J O N W A R N. He wrote a book called Slam. It was about lean startups. But one of the things he, when we, I had him in my online community, he recommended a book called Talking with Humans. One of the things is learning how to ask questions and not ask questions based on your assumptions, but how it, uh, it's, it's, a, it's asking good, open-ended questions. So I'll use the example. I've got a guy in my online community. He is building a business on helping small uh, construction companies grow. And his, his assumption was he's going to start out with bookkeeping. I said was, every small business owner needs bookkeeping, needs help with his books. 
And then he started talking to people and he suddenly realized that, wow, they all said, no, I don't want to need help with my books. I actually need help growing my business and doing strategic planning. And then he got in there and he found out that their books really sucked. <laughs> but they didn't think so until he got in there and was able to save $100,000 in taxes. He, MSU, he made stuff up. <coughs> Two questions. One, you said AARP is weird. Oh. And then the second, I think it was a slide uh, for online, free online training. So if you could put that back up. Oh, sure. Yeah, the uh, AARP, how, how many really? There's actually two AARPs. Really? really? Yes. There, there are two ARPs. There is the for-profit side. Right before that. Is MOO something? That one? No, no, it's, 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 I think it was past it. Yes, oh. that was it. That's it. That okay, thank you. Okay. Um, there are actually two ARPs. There's the for-profit side and the non-profit side. So the folks who send you all these things, buy our insurance and buy cell phone plans, and da, 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 that's the for-profit side. For profit. Okay. The non-profit side, they had a program called Life Reimagined that I followed them for three years. The idea was they were going to have people who were going to reinvent themselves online, and they're all going to be over 60, and we're going to get online and reinvent ourselves by just staring at a screen. They spent $18 million. They relaunched it three times. They killed it last year. And they actually hired Richard Leitner, who I just adore. He, he writes the repackaging your bags books. Uh, because by the way, most of us who are in our late 50s and 60s, and particularly if you're a guy, you're not sharing online. <laughs> by the way, the smallest demographic in Facebook advertising is uh, over 50 year old guys. It's one reason why my online community, I use Zoom a lot, I do mastermind groups, so people can see one another and they actually can interact with one another. And I ask everybody to pick up the phone and call somebody in the community once a week. Those of us who are a little bit older, we like to be talked to. Mm -hmm. And not text, yes. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. That's right, yes. So it's structuring. So I, I, I give you an idea. ARP one time approached me, they, they've approached me three times. The, uh, the second time was they actually asked for, they said they, they were looking for a woman who was in her 50s and looking at changing careers. And I gave her Elizabeth Reve, my intern who was in the mid-50s. They did a photo shoot with her, they interviewed her, they did all this stuff, and they never mentioned me. And I gave them all kinds of help. When they did this, they came to me because they were looking for baby boomer podcasts. I gave them all kinds of stuff. They, they, they fact-checked me three times and then didn't use anything I gave them. Because mm. a 22 year old wrote the article. Oh, okay. 22 year old, nice, nice, very nice young lady. Mm. Uh, you know, I talked to her probably a dozen times. Mm. And, oh, but by the way, they featured my podcast as one of the three Baby Boomer podcasts. Uh, Almost everybody who deals with AARP on a professional level says they are just weird. And, and they are struggling <laughs> because the way they have traditionally sold and have functioned is to folks more in Kathy's age and over 70 uh, and 75. And by the way, folks like you who have a pension, right, and versus a lot of, a lot of us, a lot of you are in your 50s. There's no pension. Most of you don't have enough savings. Retirement just It, 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 yeah, so those two worlds are 55 year olds and 75 year olds are really different in very different financial situations, and they are made of truth. They, they, everything they've done has been modeled on the 75 year old, and they're really struggling to try to figure out how they do it, how they can work for themselves. And they're trying.
Thank you.